Welcome to Midweek Prayer. As we recorded the service on Sunday, we're going to uh, put Midweek Prayer uh, or use the talk and the prayers from Sunday uh, as Midweek Prayer. I certainly would appreciate listening to Pete's talk again with a distillation of uh, teaching from uh, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer which is uh, very good. So I leave you uh, with our reflections from Sunday to watch uh, for the first time or the second time. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my all else but nor to me save that thou art be thou my best thought in the day and the night both waking and sleeping thy presence my light be thou my wisdom be thou my true word be thou ever with me and i with thee lord be thou my great father and i thy true son be thou in me dwelling and i with thee one be Thou my breastplate, my sword for the fight. Be Thou my whole armor, be Thou my true might. Be Thou my soul shelter, be Thou my strong tower. O oh, raise Thou me heavenward, great power of my power. Riches I need not, no man's empty praise. Be thou mine inheritance, now and always. Be thou and thou only the first in my heart. O sovereign of heaven, my treasure thou art. King of heaven, thou heaven's bright sun, O oh, grant me its joys after victory is won. Great heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be thou my vision, O oh, ruler of all. to the middle of Mark's Gospel where there's a turn, a change. In the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo go great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, 
and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind, not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Twenty years ago, today, what were you doing? What was on your mind? What was in the news? If September the 12th, 2020, 20, oh, 2001, sorry, doesn't jump straight to mind, perhaps September 11th or 9-11 does. Yana, who's on screen there, and I were discussing where we were on that day. For me, I remembered standing in a newsagent in Hong Firth, waiting to pay for a bottle of water, when it became clear that the inexplicable accident of a jumbo jet crashing into the World Trade Center was no accident at all, as a second jumbo crashed into the Twin Towers, killing nearly 3,000 people. A little while later, standing in a primary school surrounded by children, President George W. Bush described the moment as our Pearl Harbor and went on to inaugurate what he called the global war on terror. 20 years and many hundreds of thousands of lives later, America and its allies have now pulled out of Afghanistan, leaving only further chaos as the Afghan Taliban have flooded in to fill the vacuum left behind. For those who pushed to get on the last plane out to seek refuge away from their homes, and for those who were left behind, the fall of Kabul will be their defining moment. We all have our moments our, that we remember Moments that stand out like milestones in our life's journey. Moments that are frozen or forever etched in our memories. Perhaps Grenfell Tower, Diana's car crash, the fall of the Berlin Wall, Tiananmen Square, John Lennon's shooting, or JFK's assassination. Were you there? Today's gospel reading is one of those moments. Maybe its significance didn't stand out so much at the time for those who were there on the peripheries, perhaps the other disciples, much less the crowd. But for Peter, this moment, as Maurice mentioned, was an absolute milestone. It was a fixed point in his timeline. 
By tradition, the evangelist Mark wrote down what Peter spoke. The importance of this moment within Mark's gospel has been memorialized by Mark who places it exactly at the dramatic pivot of his gospel. Up until this point, we've walked with Simon as he left his nets and followed Jesus, becoming Peter as he walked. We have watched through his eyes, miracles, healings, feedings, the eyes of the blind being opened, deaf ears being unstopped, and mute tongues being loosed to speak. Finally, Peter is sure that he knows and understands. His eyes have been opened. He has heard Jesus. He's now ready to speak. They've just been walking through the villages near Caesarea Philippi. It was the site of a grotto where the Greek god Pan was worshipped and where Herod's son, the son of Herod the Great, Philip, set up an altar in honour of the Roman Emperor. To Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Peter now calls out with an assurance, you are Messiah. 2,000 years of religious veneer have obscured the claim that Peter was making, that Jesus was the long expected saviour who would liberate forcefully liberate Israel from the clutches of its enemies, that the Roman occupiers would be expelled and that a true son of David would sit upon his throne, his royal throne. Walking through this occupied territory that we now know as the Golden Heights, Jesus knows what danger attends this radical call. Tell no one he orders strictly. Having silenced Peter's ambitions for the revolutionary Messiah, Jesus for the first time begins to share openly who he is and why he came. That he must suffer much and be rejected. That he must be put to death and rise again. For Peter, this talk of a suffering and rejected Messiah is too much. If everything in the story so far has been pulling up the steep hill to this high point for Peter, where he confesses Jesus as Messiah, there is nothing after it that manages to apply the brakes as Peter careers down the hill towards his threefold denial of Jesus. Having been silenced by Jesus, he now attempts to silence him, taking Jesus aside and rebuking him. But Jesus will not be silenced from speaking about the suffering and rejection that attend his true mission, that attend anyone who stands in his way. And so he compares Peter to Satan, the accuser, the adversary, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God thinks, but as humans think. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, writing to his fellow Christians in 1930s Germany, faced between capitulation to the Nazi ideology, the expectations that they would join the Reich's church and sign up under Nazis' version of the Christian faith. Or the alternative, persecution and ostracism for standing firm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer sees in this passage a warning to the church at his time and the church throughout the ages. He writes, the fact that it is Peter, the rock of the church, who makes himself guilty of preventing Christ from being Christ, only after he's confessed Jesus to be the Christ and been commissioned by Christ, it shows from its very first moments the church has taken offence at the suffering Christ, 
He does not want that kind of suffering law. And as Christ's church, it does not want to be forced to accept the law of suffering from its Lord. Peter's objection is his aversion to submit himself to suffering. And that is a way for Satan to enter the church. Satan is trying to pull the church away from the cross of her Lord. And so Jesus has to make it clear and unmistakable to his disciples that the need to suffer now applies to them too. Just as Christ is only Christ as one who suffers and is rejected, so a disciple is a disciple only in suffering and being rejected, thereby participating in suffering with Christ in his crucifixion. Discipleship as allegiance to the person of Christ places the follower under the law of Christ. And that is the cross. These are harsh words from Pastor Bonhoeffer, Richard Bonhoeffer, who was later martyred for his faith. These words mirror Jesus' harsh words to Peter. We too may find those harsh words hard to hear. I know I do, and I should find them hard. Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as humans do. How does my thinking measure up against this standard? It's the challenge that's been with me for the weeks since I began preparing the talk. And I still don't have an answer. One thing, though, that's kept on coming back to me is the centrality of honest and open confession. Like an arrow falling short of its mark, sin is falling short of God's standard. A few Sundays ago, sharing about how I fall short of God's standard, in terms of my approach to time and money. I shared how the Iona community have a powerful confession in which the leader says, I confess before God and before you, God's people, that my life and the life of the world is broken by my sin. To which the congregation replies, may God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit lead you to walk in love. Only when the leader has confessed and been absolved of their sin, do the congregation collectively make the same confession and receive the same absolution. How does this apply to my aversion to suffering? Surely suffering isn't something I should seek out. I've been challenged over the last few weeks as I've prepared for today by Dietrich Bonhoeffer's discussion of this passage in relation to suffering. I'll summarise a chapter in a couple of paragraphs. Whilst we might sigh at an inconvenience and think of it as our cross to bear, Pastor Bonhoeffer makes clear that the cross is not to be confused with misfortune, harsh fate, not to be confused with our daily burden. In a powerful image in her novel, Peter Abelard, Helen Waddell suggests that just like the rings of the tree are only visible at the point at which it is cut down and yet go all the way through it. So the suffering of the cross is the bit of God that we saw. God suffers alongside all who suffer in all time and in all places. Bonhoeffer too in his chapter, the cross is to be found at the intersection, the cross section of suffering and rejection for the sake of Christ. The first suffering is to lay aside our attachments and take up the cross. Our attachments weigh heavily upon us. Those things we cling on to, cling on to us. 
But Jesus invites us to take his yoke and learn from him. In thinking about attachments, I'm reminded how Jesus' first call was to leave everything behind and follow him. I'm reminded about the parable of the sower and the seed that fell amongst thorns, representing those, perhaps representing us, who hear the word, but then become distracted by the worries of the world, the law of riches, all the other passions and distractions that come in to choke the word. And so that seed yields nothing. I'm increasingly challenged by the idea that my tendency to be pulled aside by those distractions is an aversion to engage with the vulnerability of pain, of suffering, of not knowing within my own life, and an effort to seek security or solace in things that offer only empty, transitory promises, and yet separate me from God and from my neighbour. In contrast, Pastor Bonhoeffer encourages me not to turn away from my vulnerability, but to acknowledge it honestly before God and his people. This turning towards opens me up to a liberating encounter with Jesus, an invitation into the joyous community of those who have been forgiven. The second suffering is to bear with Jesus the suffering of the world. As we watch the events of the world around us, wars and rumours of wars, environmental disasters, disease, poverty, we see that suffering is separation from the good that God intends for his creation, the original blessing that he spoke over it. Through coming into our world as a suffering and rejected Messiah, Jesus offers God's presence even in the place where he fears he seems most absent. God is a God who bears. Jesus bears the sins of the world and he invites us to bear his cross. As Jesus has come to minister God's good news of forgiveness and reconciliation. So we who follow after him, open ourselves to become ministers with him of forgiveness and reconciliation to those around us. So when we are faced with suffering in our world, particularly the incomprehensible suffering of the innocents, Pastor Bonhoeffer concludes with an invitation to trust that God's understanding is greater than our understanding. God is the God who bears. God, like that tree, chopped down the middle in which we see the rings going through. God is the God who bears and suffers with all his creation. We fulfill his will by becoming disciples of Jesus and being open to learn from the spirit and the word. In trying to respond to that invitation, a song that echoes truth for me is the summons. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name?
Let's pray. Loving God, may we follow Jesus who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. May we find our cross where suffering and rejection for the sake of Christ meet. To go where we don't know, never be the same. To risk the hostile stare, should our life attract or scare. To kiss the leather clean and do such as this unseen. To love the me I hide and quell the fear inside. To allow you to ease me out of the grasp I have of the attachments I cling to despite the damage they do to me and find the joy of taking the yoke of Jesus, leaving myself behind to care for cruel and kind. Finding your peaceful presence, even in unexpected places, as we learn to become followers and imitators of Jesus, finding that Jesus has gone before us into our communities and discovering that we can become his agents of forgiveness and reconciliation. Letting his love be shown and be grown in us, letting the blinded see and the prisoners go free, reshaping the world around, living and growing in you and you in us. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our world with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 yesterday, holding before God all around the world for whom that day was still a very painful reminder. And we take time in silence now to remember all that was unleashed upon our world on that fateful day. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who suffer now from war, disease, drought, famine, fire, and flood. For all who live in fear of COVID and whose lives have been diminished by it. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for God's church around the world that we might follow Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. So may we give ourselves in this way in his service. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those we know who are in any kind of need. Praying especially for those who are ill. And for all who struggle with the change of season, those who struggle with school, children and staff, those beginning at college or university or moving to a new place.
God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you, be with you. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you, be with you. Now and always, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you, and may God's face shine upon you always, and give you peace. Give you peace.